The first time that you hear those sail doors close behind you, you're flooded with emotions. You have a complete feeling of vulnerability. For the first time in your life, you realize you cannot control anything. You feel helpless. You feel despair. It dawns on you at that moment that life as you know it is over. I'm 45 years old at the time, and I'm looking at a 23-year sentence. I felt like life was over. At the same time, another thing dawns on you, and that's that your identity is stripped away. You know, if you think about it, all of us create identities for ourselves based on the way that we want to be perceived by the people around us. Um, Many of us men want to identify with our jobs. I'm a plumber, I'm an electrician, I'm an architect, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a businessman. Many of us want to, be, uh, want, want to um, identify as a parent. I'm a mom, I'm a dad. In, in fact, if you, have, if you have children and you've been involved with their events, you will come across people, it seems like, that they're trying to live their lives through their children. Wouldn't you agree? I'm amazed at how many people just identify themselves by their sports team. I'm a New Orleans Saints fan. I'm an LSU Tigers fan. I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. I knew if any of you were asleep, that would wake you up. It just seems that there are people whose whole life revolves around those Saturday games or those, those Sunday games. Myself... I just wanted to identify or be identified as just a good guy. But what you realize is the moment you hear that door (laughs) slam behind you is that you're not going to be a businessman anymore. You're not going to be a good father. How are you going to be a good father just talking to, being able to talk to your children on the phone every now and then? they're certainly not going to call you a good guy anymore. At the same time that they have stripped away your identities, the ones that you've created for yourself, now they're going to try to force new identities on you. Now you're a convict. Now you're a criminal. Now you're a predator. Now you're an inmate. That's a good one, inmate. Hey, inmate, what are you looking at? Hey, come over here, inmate. Everybody in that place, his name was the same as mine. It was inmate. But at the end of the day, who you really are is 346-20077. There was a couple of years where I could not for the life of me remember my social security number. I would just lay in bed at night and think, what is my social security number? But I probably will never forget 3462077 because that was my identity for a long time. 19 years in prison seemed like a bad thing, right? But you know what? We have a God who is in the business of taking a bad thing, and what does he do? He turns it into a good thing. And so I'm here today to testify to each and every one of you that even though I had to go to prison for all that time, even though I lost everything, I was separated from my family, I suffered shame, humiliation, all of those things, I wouldn't change it if I could because that's what God did in my life. He took what was a bad thing and he used it For my benefit, he turned it into a good thing. You're not going to believe this, but the life that I lived in that prison was much greater, much better than the life that I was living before I went into that prison. That's the truth. You see, because when they stripped away the identities that I wanted for myself, and when they forced those tried to force those other identities on me that I didn't want, 
It was a life-changing blessing because once I couldn't be who I wanted to be and once I was not going to be who they wanted me to be, I had no other choice but to cry out to God. I said, God, you've got to help me. You know I'm not a criminal. You know I don't belong in here. You've got to get me out of here. He didn't get me out of there, at least not right away. That's another story for another day. But what he did was something better because when I couldn't be who I wanted to be and I wasn't going to be who they wanted me to be, I listened to who God wanted me to be. I listened to who God created me to be. Now, in our church for about six weeks, the pastors preached a a series called uh, the I Am series where, where Jesus Uh, told us all of the things that he was so that we would know his identity. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I'm the door, the true vine. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and I'm the good shepherd. And all of those things are identities of Jesus. But just like our pastors preach the I Am series, there could be preached a You Are series. And I'm sure there have been thousands of times. Dr. Holloway, you have probably preach sermons about you are, because just like Jesus told us who he is, God told us who we are. He calls us his sons. He calls us ambassadors of Christ. He calls us his partners, believe it or not. He says that we are living stones that make up the spiritual temple, and that we are holy priests. He calls us salt. He calls us light. He says that we are more than conquerors. Now, in this Christian world, we love these. We love to say them to each other. Brother, I know what you're going through, but don't worry about it. You're more than a conqueror. You're a son of the living God. We love to say those things, right? I'm not sure that we always believe them. I'm not sure that we necessarily always live in them. But all of these things are true. And all of these things are good, and all of these things are are powerful. They're all blessings. But I didn't come to you today to talk about those things, because as good as all those things are, all those things are general. They apply to each and every one of us. But what I want you to explore today is the concept that God created you specially. He created you specially uniquely before there was a foundation of the world to be special and to do a special and unique work on this earth. And what I would like to to propose to you is that if you can find out who the you is that God uniquely created and you could find out what it is that he wants you to do specifically for you to do, it's going to change everything because you know what? I'm still in prison. I'm still, I've still got 20 more years to do. But now everything is different because I look at everything different. Because why? Because I see myself differently. I'm still there for 20 years. I've still lost everything. I still can't control anything, and it makes absolutely no sense, but I am filled with joy. I'm filled with joy. That's the first thing that I noticed, that I'm filled with joy. Now everything's different. Now I'm leading praise and worship. I'm leading Bible studies. God has given me these songs. He's given me the melodies and the words. They're powerful. I I sing them and I see them affecting people. People are seeking me out for prayers. And we're, we're praying with people that come to me and they're being healed and their relationships are being restored. It made all the difference in the world. You see, as children of Adam, we have an identity, and that identity is sinner. And with that word sinner comes all of this 
shame and guilt. And, and we know that, that guilt is, the, is, is Satan's favorite tool. He wants us to, be, to continue to be identified as sinner. But what happened is Jesus came into this earth and died for us so that we are no longer children of Adam. Now we are children of the living God. And when God looks at us, he no longer sees sinners. He sees Jesus. I have four things that I want to share with you today that I learned while I was in prison. So I've got four points taken from those things. And um, these are kingdom principles. Now, now, Jesus talked about when he came here, he said the com- when he first came on the scene, he said the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is among us. And so sometimes he's talking about the kingdom of God that is right here, right now. If you study his words closely, you'll see sometimes he's talking about that land of glory, that kingdom that comes at the end, that perfect kingdom that we're going to live in for eternally. But this message today is for the kingdom that is right here, right now, things that I learned in prison. The first thing I noticed, the first thing that he taught me was just what I've already mentioned, joy. We don't have to wait for our joy. Let me tell you something. I just walked around in joy all the time, no matter what my circumstances were. And I will say this to you, brothers and sisters. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you call yourselves Christians, and you're not walking around with an overwhelming feeling of joy in your heart, in your life, something is wrong. Something is wrong. Because if I could feel all of this joy in the circumstances that I was in, you've got to feel joy. He will give you joy. That's my first point. Number two, there is an attractiveness of our anointing. What do I mean by this? I mean when we do find out who we really are specifically and what specifically God has designed us to do, He's going to anoint you to do the work that He designed you to do. And when He anoints you, it's going to attract people to what you do. That attraction might manifest itself in many ways. It might be a full church. It might be other things. But He will anoint you. Now, one time I got in a multi-level marketing company. I did. And uh, in my mind, I was going to be a millionaire just like these other guys that I saw doing this. And, and, and the concept was you got you to gotta, you gotta get other people in and then you got to train them to, 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 to get other people in. And we're just all going to be rich. And I worked hard, and I got the the presentation down, and I could convince myself in the mirror that this was a good thing to be in. I was a terrible failure at that business. I couldn't get anybody in that business with me. And I found out that at that time in my life, I didn't have a sphere of influence that that you needed to be successful at that type of venture. But, you know, some people, there are just some people, something about them Whatever they're involved in, everybody wants to be in it with them. You know people like that. I don't care. You don't have to explain it to me, brother. If you're in it, I won't in. You see? Because those people are just attractive in that way. Okay? I wasn't attractive. But you know, when I found out what God specifically wanted me to do, and I started doing those things under the power of the Holy Spirit with this anointing that he put on my works. Now, everything I touch turns to gold. Everybody wants to be a part of what Brother Gene is in now. As a result, every ministry that I was involved in over this 19-year period flourished. Why? Because no longer was it Gene and his talents trying to do this, it was, Gene probably still wasn't attractive, but the anointing that, that God had put on the things that I was doing attracted people, and he'll do the same for you. The third thing, when you're doing what God designed you to do, he will flow his power through you. Now, people just start coming to my room 
No, God sent people to my room to tell you the truth. And I, at that time, I lived with these two knuckleheads in a three-man cell. And they would wait till those guys weren't around, and then they would come in and say, Brother Gene, we need your prayer. We need you to pray for me. One story that I remember specifically, this one brother comes in to me one day. I'm by myself. He comes in, and he says, Brother, um, you got to help me. I, I, I need your prayer. I'm devastated. I just got a call. They have taken my mom to the ICU. They say that she's not going to make it through the night. They've called in all the family, and, and I'm devastated because the one thing that I wanted to do was to be able to get out of this prison in time to spend, to see my mom again, to spend time with her, and now they tell me that she's not going to make it through the night. I said, brother, do you believe that even at this late hour that God can heal your mom? And he said, I do believe that, brother. I said, well, let's pray about it. And we prayed. We prayed good. Now, the next day, when I was coming home from work and entering into the building where I lived, um, I had to pass right by the, the bank of phones there. And I saw this brother on the phone, and I saw him hang up the phone. And I went to him, and I said, brother... Uh, give me some news. And he said, oh, he said, when you said that, the hair on my arms and the hair on the back of my neck just stood up. He said, they have taken my mom back out of ICU and put her in a regular room. They say she's going to be all right, brother. And I said, praise God. But now this started, th this started a chain of events in motion. Now every couple of months, the brother's got some problem and he comes to me for prayer. Um, family, uh, family illnesses, relationship problems, financial problems, whatever it is, we pray for him. And every single time that we pray for him, God does what we ask him to do. Fixed, fixed, fixed. But I start thinking, am I doing this guy a justice? Does he just think that I'm some sort of a good luck charm? He can come to me and I'll fix all of his problems? I'm thinking, does he think that, only, that God will only answer m my prayers? He can go to God in prayer just, just like I do. And then it occurred to me, I'm not even sure if the brother is saved. I worried about that for a little while. Then one day, I come home from work. He's waiting on me at the cell. He says, brother, you're never going to guess what has happened. What's that, brother? He said, there's a guy in my, down there in my room, and he wants to accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. I said, brother, have you been down there witnessing to this fella? I lost it all the way then. I knew I was going to lose it. Probably why I did. He said, yes, and he wants to do it. Then he said, um, could I bring him down here and let you talk to him? I'm not sure what to do next. But praise God. Surely he was saved if he was, if, if he was bringing other people to Christ. Praise God. The fourth and, and final point that I want to make is that the other thing I found out was that God will endorse what you do if you're doing what is in his will. So I was involved in a Bible study when I was at Siegelville, Texas at this time. We had a Bible study that met every day at 6 o'clock uh, on, on the rec yard. And um, it started out with three people. Well, really it started out with two people, and then I was on the, out there near them playing a, playing a guitar. This is probably, you know who, trying to mess up what I'm about to say. He doesn't like this part at all. So, so before I knew it, I had committed to be there every night at 6 o'clock and play the guitar. So I would, we would start off every, every Bible study playing three or four songs. And this one, this one afternoon, uh, I'm sitting on this picnic table. I'm sitting on the table, and I've got my feet on the bench, and I'm playing this song. And this song that I'm playing is a song that I hadn't played for them that much, but it had a lyric in the song. I, I, I almost played it today. It said, um, you are the rainbow across the sky. You are life's reason. No, you are life's meaning 
the very reason why. So I'm singing this, and, and as I do often when I'm really getting into it, I've got my eyes closed. I'm singing this song about the rainbow. I open my eyes, and everyone is gone. No one's there. I look way over there. There they all are. They have their back turned to me, and I say, fellas, hey, I'm over here singing my heart out. What's, what's the deal? They go, Brother Gene, you got to come see this. And so I go over there, and sure enough, there's a rainbow across the sky, just like I was singing, only this isn't one, some puny rainbow. This is a rainbow that's like three times as wide as they normally are, and it's not, it's not faded out looking. It's vivid. It has all of the colors of the spectrum. It's, it's this wide. It's the best rainbow. Well, I had seen one rainbow like that. It goes all the way from ground all the way over to ground, and it's brighter than anything you've seen. And I said, fellas, it doesn't get any better than this. Right as I said that, God put another one just like it right under it. Now we got two rainbows that each one of them is better than any rainbow you've ever seen. A couple of years ago, a couple of years after that, I got, I got transferred to Texarkana to another prison. Um, we, had a, we, had a night, we had it going on in that chapel. We had, um, we had electric guitars and organs and keyboards and pianos and guys playing trumpets and, and uh, cordless microphones and, and, and everything. And so we had two chaplains there. One of those chaplains was going to, uh, one of those chaplains got, got transferred. That left one chaplain trying to be a chaplain to 1,600 people. He had to go out of town one day. He calls us all in and he says, guys, I'm going out of town Sunday. I cannot believe myself what I'm going to say, but this is what God put on my heart, and so I'm going to do it. I wouldn't have chose it, but Garland, you're going to preach next Sunday. Now, I had, I had led praise and worship. I had led Bible studies, but I have never preached. But I got in there in my cell, and um, I got my ego in the way, and I started trying to prove to everybody my great theology and how smart I was. And I had a, a waste paper basket full of, 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 of wadded up papers. Finally, I let, I let God, I, I let go and let God, as they say. And, and I got the thing together. I preached it. I thought it was a pretty good deal. I thought I did well. I got con kind comments from everyone. Now, because the, the chaplain wasn't there and just a guard was overseeing us, instead of us exiting through the building like we usually do, he made us go out on the, the rec yard. I'm three or four, four or five back in, in, in line, and people are going, wow, look at that, look at that, look at that. Now, these guys don't know my rainbow story. They don't. But that's what there is. They say, look at that. There's a rainbow. There's another one of those rainbows across the sky. And some guy innocently said that didn't know anything about the other rainbow said, God must really be pleased with the way that Brother Gene preached today. I ended up doing 19 years in prison before I got out. I got a job at a church in Denton. And I was able to do a nursing home ministry where I would go there twice a week and, and I would sing the old hymns and I would pray with them and I'd go around to the rooms of the people who couldn't make it to the, to the, to the meetings. It's one of the most fulfilling things that I've ever done in my life. Now, I didn't go to that nursing home looking for a wife. I didn't. But I found one. I, I found my beautiful wife right there because I had sit over here in this chapel teaching classes over here at the camp in Pollock where I met Dr. Holloway. And I would tell those guys, I'm not going to ever get married again. I've got, I've got ministries to do. I've got, I've got grandkids to, to, that were all born when I was in prison. I want to get to know them. I've got three daughter-in-laws that, that I need to get to know. I've got to make up for time. with. I, I want to get my mom and dad are still alive, hopefully, at that time. And, and uh, I've got too much to do. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, it, I love women, I, but I'm through with women. <laughs> but just before... Just before it was time for me to get out, again, that's another story for another day, God started putting on my heart, hey, 
It's not good for man to be alone. I've got work for you to do. I do. But you need a helper. And I have someone for you that's going to be perfect. And I'm telling you, this beautiful woman here that I met at that nursing home when I wasn't looking for a husband, a wife, and... <laughs> And she wasn't looking for a husband, for sure, but there she was. And I promise you that she surpasses my wildest dreams. There, no way could I ever imagine a woman, a partner, that's as good as this woman sitting right over here. I did not know that they made wives that good. I didn't. Anyway, um, we, uh, we celebrated our one-year anniversary on March the 17th, which means we got married on March the 17th when this pandemic was busting loose. The, the world was going to end in 48 hours, according to all the reports. Already we could only have 50 people at a time in the church, right? We had 150 RSVPs for the wedding. The wedding was supposed to be on March the 21st. I said, baby, March the 21st ain't coming. Let's get married tomorrow. Hey, she bought it. We did it. One of the best decisions she ever made in her life. That she'll be paying for the rest of her life. We went to a store and we bought some wedding rings. We bought some wedding rings, engagement ring. We paid for those rings. We came out that door. We looked up in the sky. What did we see, baby? A rainbow. There was a rainbow up across that sky in the parking lot where we bought those rings. God was telling me, hey, this is the woman that I had for you. You are doing what I want you to do. Here's your rainbow. Now, God may not, God may not endorse what you do in that same way with a rainbow, but if you're doing what he wants you to do under the power that he equips you with, You're going to feel joy. You're going to attract people to what you do. God will flow his power through you, and it will be undeniable, and he's going to endorse what you do. I want to just close with this. It took me going to prison to cry out to God and to find out why he created me and what he wanted me to do in this earth. My question for you is, what's it going to take for you to cry out to God and get all of the blessings he has waiting for you?